Welcome to Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our website is libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. Today we are talking with Michael Greva about his new book, The Upside Down Constitution, which will be released in February of 2012 by the Harvard University Press. Michael is the John G. Surley Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and is the author of six books, including most recently a book co-authored with Michael Zoller entitled Citizenship in America and Europe, Beyond the Nation State. In addition to this, Michael is the head of AEI's Transatlantic Law Forum and is the chairman of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Michael also founded and co-directed the Center for Individual Rights, a public interest law firm specializing in constitutional litigation. Michael, welcome to Liberty Law Talk. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. Michael, your book, The Upside Down Constitution, advances uh, the argument that our Constitution is best understood as a competitive federal document, that is to say, in its in its formation, in its structure, and in its, you know, the doctrine to protect the structure. It is designed to promote maximum choice, competition, uh, liberty for individuals as individuals, and not states as states. And I think this is a crucial part of the book, you know, the, really this opening argument, because uh, while we might think this is just true now, it, it wasn't always seen as true. And it also is, you argue, uh, the current federalism we have doesn't really protect individuals as individuals, but looks to the states as states to be partners with the federal government in this you know, s- sort of all-consuming regulatory tax uh, you know, type of government system that we have now. And you also make the argument, which I think is important, that the states as states are not necessarily virtuous, but are actually adversarial towards, uh, in many respects, liberty uh, and the choice and autonomy and competition we think our federalist structure embodies, that actually what they seek to do is appropriate for themselves a surplus, a tax regulatory surplus, uh, which you know they use for their benefit and you know, largely leave leave the individual, leave businesses out of that uh, out of that sort of calculation. So let me ask you from the beginning, Michael, what is competitive federalism, uh, and what is the kind of federal? You, you you make this question. It's not are we going to have federalism, but what kind of federalism? So you know, you know, talk to us about this competitive federal structure and and the the kind of federalism it embodies. Sure. Uh, look, the general idea is to sort of step, take one step back from the Constitution and what we know from the history and ask yourself sort of a very simple question. Uh, if the world were your oyster, sort of in a pre-constitutional position, uh, would you want a federal structure? And if so, what, to what end and what should it look like? And uh, from an individual, I mean, pre-constitutional perspective, and this is sort of, you know, applied James Buchanan, um, the only point of federalism is to sort of solve a monopoly problem. That is to say, um, you try to limit the central government's reach, uh, and then um, you try to put yourself in a position where states as states, sort of the junior governments, have to compete uh, for mobile capital, uh, for mobile uh, talent, uh, mobile resources, firms, citizens, all the rest of it. And you hope that, that uh, mobili- the mobility among states will discipline state governments. And there's still a fair bit of that going on uh, in the United States. There's, for example, um, ferocious uh, tax competition among states, and that discipline states, not all of them we know, but most of the time and a lot of them. Um, and that's altogether uh, a good thing. And so so that's the situation. Now, uh, you put yourself into sort of the shoes of a state, meaning state elites, state officials, prior to a constitution. Would you like that kind of federalism? And the answer, obviously, is no, you wouldn't. 
because competition is your enemy because it constrains you in collecting taxes and handing the proceeds to your friends and constituencies. And so what states want uh, is routinely is a cartel. That is to say, uh, have the federal government tax people on a global basis and hand the money over uh, to state governments so that they don't have to compete for it. A lot of federalisms around the world are organized on that principle. Germany's is an example. Um, uh, ours ha- our federalism has acquired a lot of those traits. So, for example, Medicaid uh, and other programs are run on that basis. The feds collect the money and then they send it to the states to see uh, to, to spend uh, on their own accord within certain parameters. That has caused all sorts of problems. Uh, and it's not a very good thing uh, for citizens in all sorts of ways. Uh, and so that's the, the the basic lay of the land. The argument is that the first competitive kind of federalism is really the one uh, that the founders had in mind, that the constitutional structure uh, protects, and that during the New Deal later on, uh, this regime got inverted because the states and the federal government just overwhelmed the system. And that's the argument in a nutshell. Let me ask you this, Michael, as a way to, and I don't want to skip straight to the New Deal, because there's a significant portion of your book that really focuses on the jurisprudence of the 19th century and the way in which these justices are, you know, reacting to this sort of anti-competitive behavior of the states and trying to preserve the Constitution's competitive structure, uh, as you outline it. But you make this statement, and I think it really uh, provides a nice way to think about your argument, that the type of federalism of the New Deal maybe in crucial respects, directly, uh, you know, proceeding from the ideas of the anti-federalist and this idea of the states as states as the the principal regulators and not individuals, which I thought was a provocative statement, uh, given that the anti-federalists are largely seen uh, in many quarters as providing a crucial balance to the Constitution uh, and sort of the protections they stepped in to provide against the kind of you know, maybe the overly centralized structure initially proposed by Madison and others. So I, I, I wanted to know if you could just kind of comment on that briefly, what you meant by that statement. Yeah, sure. Um, it, 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 let me take one step back. There is, of course, a long tradition in American political thought that states would act as a check on the central government. And that was true uh, during the antebellum era, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, a little after that. But once you get to the 20th century, uh, the standard pattern is a state demand for central intervention. Uh, If you look at the cases uh, that we all uh, hold so dear, uh, the, the, the New Deal cases, there's not a single case in which the states protested the federal government. That was always small businessmen who uh, resisted uh, centralization. The states were all in favor of it. They were for fiscal transfers. They were for federal laws, labor laws, agriculture law that locked all of them um, into a cartel. What that had, has in common with the anti-federalist is really the insistence on the protection of states and state political elites as states, right? That is what they they didn't want to get. Uh, uh, that is what um, Hamilton and Madison argued against. If you read Federalist One at the bottom of the first page, Hamilton says, look, I realize that, uh, you know, look, a lot of people are persuadable by argument, and that's why I'm writing these papers, and why my colleague Mr. Madison is writing these papers, but there's certain people who cannot be persuaded, who have simply have to be beaten, and that is state officials uh, who cling to their offices and who fear any diminution of the power consequence and emolument of their office that they would suffer under the Constitution. Um, and that is what the New Deal, the, the anti-federalist tradition, uh, the, the tradition against which Hamilton argued, that is what the New Deal inherited, not for its own sake, not because it was sort of romanticizing state governments, but because it figured out that state governments are brilliant places for redistribution uh, and uh, for occupation by interest groups uh, that the New Deal liked. And so the New Deal strategy was not, as is commonly believed, to centralize everything and to augment the powers of the national government. It was to augment and empower governments at all levels, 
state, federal, local, you name it, and that's the federalism we inherited. Now, and this is this is an interesting part of your book. I mean, if if you've gone to an American law school in the last half century, you probably still can recall the holding uh, in the famous Erie, Pennsylvania Railroad case. Um, but I think what you do in your book is you you certainly, in my mind, present uh, a, a, not a new interpretation, but a very powerful reading of the case, uh, which is to say. Erie is about, as, as you just said, uh, empowering government to regulate at all levels. Whereas, you know, my reading of Erie always was this was something good in the sense of unleashing federalism and allowing uh, it within diversity jurisdiction uh, litigation, actually allowing state law to be used in substantive areas. And I thought that was probably a good thing. Um, but you say, actually, no, it's th- th- not, not a good thing because you're actually empowering the states to uh, set the worst, the most egregious forms of extraterritorial legislation. Plaintiffs understand this and can foreign sh- forum shop in, in light thereof. Uh, and this actually sort of breaks down the, the competitive principles you talk about in the book. So before we really just, I think, move into Erie, I, I do want to ask you something uh, about the, the competitive structure and the courts, because you, you argue the Constitution assigns institutional problems or, or the, the different problems to different institutions as a ways of, of most efficiently dealing with them, and that the court on so many questions is much better suited to defend at least the horizontal federalist structure you articulate as opposed to the Congress. Um, talk about how, you know, the sketch for us, how the courts did that. I mean, there's, and there's also this development you talk about of the common law doctrines of the Constitution to aid that process. Uh, sure. Uh, I should preface this by saying this isn't really my argument. This is sort of conventional wisdom uh, among a lot of legal scholars, in particular those who uh, study uh, Europe and, and uh, the, the structure of the European Union. And the basic idea is this. Uh, Any time you have a federal structure, you're going to have massive coordination problems um, among the member states and the member jurisdictions. And the question is, um, how do you integrate that and on what terms? And I've, as, as we uh, talked about earlier, uh, what I want and what I think the Constitution wants is to um, let people make their own choices and basically have a free market regime across state lines. And there isn't really much doubt that that is, in fact, what the Constitution requires. That is why there's a prohibition against import and export taxes, why there's a contract clause forbidding states from impairing the obligation of contract, why there's a tonnage clause, why there's a compact clause, and on and on and on. Most of it, why there's a privileges and immunities clause in Article 4 that protects citizens against discrimination. All right. Um, as you can see from that litany of clauses, uh, they're in a way redundant because Congress, you could always write a constitution that allows Congress just to legislate those things, right? We're talking about interstate commerce here. So why can't Congress protect uh, citizens against discrimination? Why can't Congress clamp down on the states and say, no, you can't tax stuff um, that comes from, from out of state and so on and so forth? And the expectation is, well, Congress won't. Um, because it is mostly made up from up of people who come from states who can guarantee um, uh, interaction and and uh, trade and so forth among states on competitive non discriminatory terms and under uh, a regime of non aggression among states and the answer is the federal courts, the United States Supreme Court, just as in Europe, the European Court of Justice has basically uh, accomplished the same um, process. And the reason why that cuts, why integration, legal integration, economic integration that is led by courts uh, will proceed on competitive terms is that courts can't harmonize stuff. They can beat back state interferences with interstate commerce, but they can't say, okay, now we'll arrange uh, for transfer payments among the losers, um, or um, we will harmonize your state laws. They can't do any of that. And so by institutional design, they're just much better at saying, uh, at issuing prohibitions and injunctions against states and saying, no, you can't have that interference. No, you can't have the uh, this tariff or uh, regulatory equivalent, you have to 
live in a competitive environment too bad for you. And Congress could never, ever bestow itself to erect anything remotely resembling such a competitive regime. And that's the genius of the Constitution, to transfer the enforcement authority uh, of pro-competitive norms to the federal judiciary and cut Congress out of the bargain, unless and until it bestows itself to ruin and wreck the regime, which unfortunately it does all too often. (laughs) Let me ask you this question, Michael. The holding in SWIFT uh, depended upon a federal a general common law, and you you argue we need a, a rehabilitation of this concept. It, it now exists in certain constitutional enclaves, but is actually a crucial piece of, of the competitive federal structure. Uh, Joseph Story certainly understood this, and you lay out this very well in your book when he you know wrote the SWIFT opinion to ensure uh, continental commerce would require not being subject to 50 different or you know different state uh, laws that might be pro or anti commerce or you know pro or anti uh, you know regulation and, and in the sense of you know allowing people to depend upon a, a general standard that would be enforceable uh, by by the by the federal government uh, you know, transcending these particular state interests their parochial interest and Erie overturns this. Why is Erie, uh, what is the court up to in Erie? Let me ask, just put that question to you. Uh, what it is up to is, in, I mean, in a and nutshell, me, yeah. I'd be happy to talk about Erie, uh, about Swift versus Tyson and why it was so important uh, as well. I mean, the importance comes into view, if you remember, that that case was about negotiable instruments, that is to say financial instruments. And, and the question was, um, uh, are those protected by federal common law? Um, and you have to remember to see the the importance of this that at the time we had no federal common currency in the United States. The basic uh, means of credit and exchange were these negotiable instruments, and had those been sort of freely. Um, Had states been free to mess with those and say, no, never mind, Um, you know, you don't have to make good on these uh, instruments, Um, it it would have had a big effect. Now, um, uh, forward to Erie, what the court is really up to there is it's the end point of a long, long, long uh, debate about the federal courts and the Supreme Court's diversity jurisdiction, that is to say, cases between citizens from different states. Okay, And the progressive movement, movement from the get-go uh, wanted to abolish diversity jurisdiction altogether uh, because they thought that's the federal courts trampling on the poor states. Uh, that's a protection for corporations. Um, you know, and what we ought to do is empower state governments um, to regulate corporations to a much, much greater degree uh, than diversity jurisdiction and the federal courts will ever allow. And that went absolutely nowhere um, in, in Congress or anywhere else. And so what Erie does is it protects, I mean, it doesn't touch diversity jurisdiction itself. It says, no, fine, uh, that can continue to exist. But uh, we, the federal courts, will henceforth follow the law of the state, where the case came from, and that's usually um, the, uh, you know, the state that the plaintiff chose. And so what that does is it ties federal courts to the law of the plaintiff's uh, state, um, in in effect, and there's no check on exploitative extraterritorial uh, state uh, uh, state jurisdiction uh, from then on forward. And, uh, you know, to that fateful decision, we owe, you know, a whole lot of things that uh, have gone wrong in American law. No, and, and I think this is a key part of your book. Uh, and, and also, I, I do want to try and address with you because, you know, in you know, pedagogical terms, Erie is, is never really given the public choice analysis you present, but is largely seen as a repudiation of, uh, and, and this is a wrong understanding of the common law, but this sort of platonic doctrine that Story and other 19th century justices were engaged in, where they thought they could actually reach up and find the law and pull it down into the city, as it were. And, and, and of course, we know, I mean, the common law is actually far more Aristotelian than that. But in that, in that sense, it seems to me the federal general common law that you present uh, 
does pose problems for the separation of powers. And many advocates of you know, judicial restraint would argue that this could be actually judicial empowering doctrine. You argue that it's not and that this is actually key to thinking about the New Deal because these, these doctrines like the Dormant Commerce Clause, preemption doctrine, ways to think about the doctrines that police enumerated powers and also state police powers have really been redesigned by the courts uh, to allow this sort of cartelized federalism. Uh, yes, and they all, at the end of the day, you know, hang on Erie or uh, at least on its spirit, right? Um, it, look, the, the 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 standard line that first Felix Frankfurter and then his modern day heirs, conservative heirs, I should say, um, Robert Bork trumpeted was the federal courts have no business ordering. Uh, state-to-state relations in this fashion, we should let Congress take care of this, right? That's the separation of powers argument. There's, you know, a whole lot of bells and whistles, um, but, but you basically can ignore those. Now, did Felix Frankfurter sort of have a point in saying, come on now, let Congress take the lead in this and the New Dealers? Yeah, kind of, sort of, you can see that, you know, a, a Congress that is very disciplined and you know, led in effect by a president who's enormously popular, you know, might bring itself to sort of order state, uh, state-to-state state relations um, in some fashion, although not in a fashion that you or I, uh, or most of our listeners, I would suspect, would like. Um, if you go to the modern era, it is manifest that Congress cannot order relations among states. It is very bad already at saying this belongs to the federal government or this belongs to the states. Uh, Occasionally, it's capable of doing that. That's all these preemption statutes. But if you look at them uh, and how murky they are, you see how bad Congress is at those kinds of things. And Congress is completely incapable uh, of saying this belongs to state A and that belongs to state B. Uh, The only modern day example that is like that, that I can think of, is the Defense of Marriage Act, right, which tried in Section 2 to compartmentalize uh, marriage law along state lines. Um, but you can see how extraordinary uh, that actually is. And the only reason why it came about was that it was such a controversial topic that Congress didn't have the nerve to say, we will legislate our own standard. Well, if when it comes to, to stuff that's less controversial and less sort of riven with ideological overtones, Congress, you know, all the time says, Here, here's our standard. And, um, uh, you know, this is no longer the state's, this is now ours. Um, So this is a long-winded, very long-winded, and I apologize, way of saying um, the notion that Congress should take the lead on these matters, on choice of law questions and interstate relations and all the rest of it, it just grossly overstates the capacity of Congress to provide ordering rules. And uh, the modern-day progressives know that. You argue, I mean, and this also gets into the idea, I think in particular your analysis of the Rehnquist Court's attempt to reclaim a federalism, and the sense they don't seem to understand, you argue, horizontal federalism, which is a lot of what we've been discussing. They, they tend to see federalism only in the vertical uh, uh, manifestation of that, and as such, they miss these crucial points uh, that you're that you're arguing in your book. Horizontal federalism remains unchallenged. But something, you, an interesting point in your book, I think, is you really tie this to the reigning uh, constitutional um, uh, philosophy, uh, which is originalism. And you say originalism seems to kind of naturally pave the way for the erosion of these doctrines that that protected com- you know, competitive federalism. Uh, talk about that briefly and, and talk about, if you would, what you think, you know, what, what sort of doctrines, uh, you know, constitutional hermeneutics should replace this. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, I wouldn't say it, it's paved the way for the erosion. I would say originalism is, you know, incapable of recovering what the constitutional memory that, that has been lost. I mean, the, the doctrines have eroded for, you know, all sorts of reasons and would have done so with or without originalism. Originalism. Here's what I mean by originalism. I, I should say at the outset, in a lot of ways, this is a very originalist book in spirit. Yes. Um, yes. Right? Uh, so what I'm now criticizing is sort of 
textualist originalism that says sort of the Calvinist theory of the Constitution, right? The text, the text, the text, and that's the end of it. Um, I don't believe that. I don't think you can, and, and there are two reasons for uh, why I don't believe that. On one side, I don't think you can make sense um, of the constitutional text without some theory of what this beast is supposed to be doing. And that's what I try to recover in the first part of the book. All right? uh, and the, the originalist argument that, oh, no, no, you can't do that because that's political theory, and uh, needless to say, there will be more than one political theory, and that means, uh, you know, it's open season on the Constitution so far as the judiciary is concerned. I don't believe that. Um, and the second part, so, so that's one side, the political theory that forms the bedrock of the Constitution. And the other side is that, um, you know, every once in a blue moon, there's a case where the Supreme Court really looks at the original text. Uh, and, th th like, whoa, we're discovering this now. So the gun rights cases, for example, are like that, right? The S Second Amendment, there hasn't been a case in eons about that. So you, you basically look, there's nothing between you and the constitutional text. But that's not, I mean, 98% of constitutional law isn't like that. All of constitutional law that I learned and that I teach is doctrine. Right? So there's a dormant commerce clause doctrine, which is inferred from the Constitution. There are oodles of federalism doctrines that are inferred from the Constitution and not literally in it. There's a sovereign immunity doctrine. Um, there is, you know, the unitary executive, and on and on and on and on. All of these things are doctrines that are elaborated over time. And it seems to, and, and that is why this book is so long, because it tries to trace the doctrinal developments and where they went off the rails. It strikes me as obvious that, you know, once you say yes to a constitution, and especially a constitution that is so deliberately minimalist as ours, you have said yes to doctrine, and you've run the risk that the enterprise may get away from you. Um, and and if all goes right, you will still need the doctrines to elaborate the text over time and apply it in particular circumstances and situations. And so, uh, to the extent that modern day originalists um, and I should I should emphasize, this is not all of them. Um, Right? Michael McConnell is an original, Professor Michael McConnell, he's an originalist, right? He has very high regard for political theory. He knows all the doctrinal stuff and completely understands that that is how judges behave. All I'm saying is that there are particular, um, you know, uh, narrow-minded uh, originalist uh, positions that give far too little attention to political theory behind the Constitution on the one hand, doctrine on the other hand, and therefore they frequently go wrong, and therefore they can't really contribute very much to sort of recovering the competitive Constitution that I'm trying to recall here. Uh, on that score, uh, and, and, and thinking about you know, the minimalist Constitution, um, two terms you have in your book that I wanted to you know, briefly just let you elaborate on, um, uh, but also think about on this light. One is, is the cartel federalism, uh, and, and also what you, what you say we have now, empowerment federalism. But also in thinking about this recovery of the competitive constitution, you're also somewhat pessimistic in that you say, the con and what I read you to be saying, the constitution seems to have no inbuilt uh, inbuilt, self-enforcing, self-defensive mechanisms by which this inverted upside-down constitution can just be can be really dealt with and and arrested and remediated. It largely depends upon things outside of the constitution, like say citizenship, like say maybe fiscal ruin, uh, and and even sectionalism within the country. Uh, certainly, don't want the type of sectionalism in the antebellum period, but that's an example which actually helped preserve uh, a competitive structure. Uh, so, you know, briefly talk about this this inversion process, uh, and actually, you know, and you I think you nicely connect this up with also the rights agenda of the court, particularly the, the Warren and the Brennan courts, um, uh, given that particularly New Dealers didn't really look to the courts as their main agents of progress, 
but then obviously did turn in, in that direction. And, and you seem to, you suggest one way to think about this is the Caroline Products case. Sure. Um, that's a whole lot. And so let me start at one end and, and uh, I'm sure I'll leave something out if you then follow up. That, okay. That'll be great. great. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, so let me start on the uh, at the inversion end. Um, and again, this is not. I mean, and and I should say that um, what's really, to my mind, new and revolutionary about this book is the way it puts a lot of things together. You know, as opposed to you know, wow, having discovered some new economic theorem. No, I haven't. Um, uh, here's the thing: uh, there are hundreds and thousands of economists who are very, very fond of competitive federalism. And they, you know, have developed these models and all sorts of specifications. What they all agree on, however, is is the second thing, which is that competitive federalism cannot maintain itself. There are just too many pressures um, emanating from states, uh, from interest groups, uh, that really loathe the disciplining force of competitive federalism. We've talked earlier about states really wanting a, you know, wanting to lock themselves into a cartel, um, and that pressure it, it exists under any federal system. It's a given, and so even if you start with a clean competitive constitution, over time um, it'll erode and and so flip into a cartel because that's just the way the politicians uh, want to run uh, the system. And the critical question is not why did that happen in the United States? Because it happened absolutely everywhere uh, on the planet with a few possible exceptions. The question is what took them so long, right? Over a full century. And the answer is two-part answer. One is, and there's a complicated argument, which I'd be happy to elaborate on, is that the, comp- the Constitution itself is so vehemently pro-competitive that it takes very unusual circumstances to get out of that uh, system and to cartelize it. And that's basically what the New Deal uh, affected. That's one part of it. And the second thing that kept the system um, from sort of collapsing into sort of whole, wholesale cartelization um, and, and the kind of federalism that we have now is sectionalism. That is to say, a division among states, uh, right? So that there are always some states, there's a cohesive block of states that says no to any attempt to sort of cartelize um, the, the, the federal system. Um, you asked about the and and that obviously sort of waned, uh, uh, you know, after the the Civil War. Um, it, it remained there, there remained a sort of strong sectional force in American politics. Uh, it remained even during the New Deal. Uh, this is, uh, for example, why the New Deal, despite its best efforts, could never legislate health insurance um, on a nationalist uh, national basis. Why it could never. Um, uh, nationalized education, the South just wouldn't stand for it. And so that was the residual force um, of, of um, sectionalism in American politics. <clears throat> and it took until the Great Society to sort of break those barriers. And that's that's where we are now. Um, there's a very... I, I realize how scandalous this may sound to a lot of people, but this is what uh, the great William Riker, uh, one of the greatest political economists uh, of the, the 20th and 21st century, meant when he said that, you know, the history of federalism in America is the history of slavery. Um, th- that's what drove the sectional divisions. It's not a proud history, but one has to realize that something like that it may have to be um, operative to sort of protect competitive federal structures. Now, um, fast forward. You asked about the modern day, uh, modern Supreme Court's rights agenda. Um, the way I interpret it is that uh, it basically uh, federalism will become cartelized on all margins, in all dimensions. Um, environmental policy, education. 
um, you name it, uh, sooner or later, uh, there'll be some sort of cooperative arrangement between the federal government um, and and the states so that everyone gets uh, their piece of the pie. The only um, issues on which that doesn't quite work in the political sector uh, are issues on which there are fierce and often sectional um, divides that run very, very deep. Um, abortion, gay rights, uh, those kinds of things. And that is why if you want to sort of harmonize, cartelize federalism in those domains, the Supreme Court has to step in and uh, sort of adjudicate things in light of uh, the you know, enlightened opinions of mankind or the constitution of Zimbabwe or whatever. What it's really trying to do, what the Supreme Court is trying to do in those kinds of cases, um, is to find some, you know, enlightened uh, social consensus uh, that ropes sort of the dissident states um, uh, in, into into modernity, so to speak. And on some issues, it's uh, succeeded, and on on other issues, it's uh, uh, en- encountered uh, a lot of resistance. <clears throat> but by and large, people seem to be sort of perfectly happy with the Supreme Court that plays that role. Uh, if I had my druthers, if sort of, if you ask me, what would the Constitution, what would American federalism, what would jurisprudence look like, if I had my way, there would be much less of this sort of, you know, rights enthusiasm um, it, it, that that is targeted at sort of basically, you know, dragging the American South into postmodernity. Uh, to be blunt about it. Uh, and that'd be a whole lot more judicial protection for the commerce of the United States. And I think, um, so, there'd be a lot more judicially supplied structure and a lot fewer judicially supplied rights. And I think once you make that trade-off, uh, you'll reapproximate the sort of basic design of the Constitution uh, much more closely than, uh, than we're capable of doing under, under our current obsessions. Now we're coming to the end of the interview, and I I, I wanted to you know, think about you know the this sort of cooperative federalism, this empowerment federalism, because you also suggest um, while it's it's very difficult to dislodge, it also lacks the capability, I think, of of having a long term presence, precisely because of the incentives it it introduces into the system, uh, particularly for states, and and the question is you know just really money and what the states uh, believe they can do in terms of spending while not actually raising their own taxes, relying on the federal government. And then this now comes to a full head with, you know, obviously our current situation, the 2008 crisis, the, you know, many states are strapped, particularly the states that have followed the blue model. And, uh, you know, so this is something that, that's out there. And, and I don't know what you think about that. But also, uh, something that, and we just know this has been in the headlines with the the Boeing case and the NLRB recently dropped the suit, but yet this might be, I think, an, uh, you know, something like the sectionalism you think is you you argue is virtuous, uh, precisely because right to work states now have a a very powerful economic interest. It seems that's been opened uh, by the NLRB. Uh, yes. And, and it, I mean, I, I should say, I think that NLRB and right to work issue, uh, it's important in its own right, but it's also a very, very good sort of proxy for, you know, the, the general configuration of, of American um, uh, politics. Uh, I think there are a lot of states, especially in the South, but not exclusively also in the mountains, uh, in, in the mountain regions, <coughs> excuse me, um, that are... Um, Less regulation-minded, more libertarian, if you want, uh, than, uh, you know, the the states that used to be the center of American politics, which is the Northeast and the um, and the Great Lakes states. states. Um, if you could stitch those states together in a in into a relatively stable political coalition that will in Congress and in the courts and across the board resist sort of federal interventions, a lot would be gained. Um, And it's without all the sort of ugliness that has traditionally um, characterized uh, sectionalism in 
American politics. And you see this in a lot of areas, right? Resistance to some EPA schemes, that's an example. Um, the right to work uh, example uh, we already mentioned. There are other examples like that. Um, and Governor Perry, in his own inarticulate way, actually has tried to sort of capture some of that. Whether that would work politically or not, I really have no idea. Um, uh, you know, it takes a lot to sort of stitch together a, a block like that, right? And to to prevent defections, to prevent somebody from saying, um, you know, okay, fine, we'll buy you in. Um, if you remember the Cornhusker kickback kicked back <laughs> right during the negotiations over Obama, Obamacare, that's what we're talking about. There's a state that resists, fine, here's some more money, let's go. Um, you'd have to prevent that, and it would have to be very, very ideological. Um, it, but that's a chance, uh, that's the only chance, quite frankly, that I see for sort of rehabilitating as a political matter rather than uh, as a matter of grand um, you know, uh, jurisprudential thought, something resembling the competitive federalism uh, that we once had. Let me say one thing about the money, um, it, it, which is, yeah, the feds are bankrupt. So are a lot of the states. And as I try to show, and again, this isn't me, this is, you know, great many economists who have seen this. Yeah, the federal government constantly incentivizes states to spend um uh, 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 over their uh, abilities, in excess of their abilities. That's the point of all these federal spending programs, and especially um, Medicaid. Now, you don't see that as much as you see it in, in uh, let's say, Europe and Greece, because states operate under these balanced budget amendments, so where the, under, where the overspending uh, and the excessive commitments show up is the pension funds. There are something like $4 trillion in underfunded pensions out there. I think, personally, this will end very, very badly. Uh, other countries uh, that have found themselves into that, in, in that situation have done very draconian things. Um, so, uh, in Argentina, for example, uh, the state and local pensions were rolled into the, uh, into the federal system. Okay, and then um, Mrs. Kirshner said, uh, yeah, we'll pay your pensions, except even if they're denominated in dollars, we'll pay you back in Argentinian pesos. I think something like that is also going to happen in the United States, because uh, as my colleague Alex Pollock here at the American Enterprise likes to say, uh, debts that cannot be paid will not be paid. I think that's true of the state pension and retirement costs. Um, there are other things that could happen. Um, you know, in uh, both Brazil and Argentina, what eventually happened is that uh, with all these bankrupt states, uh, that the federal government um, imposed very draconian budget controls on states, sent their own officials to take the states effectively into receivership. This is what states already do to cities, like what Michigan is doing to Detroit uh, nowadays. Uh, I wouldn't be I mean, the, the, it won't play out that way in the United States because there are constitutional norms and rules against this. Um, you know, but I'm not very optimistic. Um, it, the question is, you know, always how bad does it have to get before somebody steps back and says we have to fix this? And um, it's pretty bad now. It's going to get worse. And even then, the system cannot easily bring itself to say, let's fix this. As, as Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a good nation. Michael, on that yep. uh, uh, on that somewhat pessimistic note, uh, we're going to come to a close. Thank you for being on Liberty Law Talk and discussing your new book, The Upside Down Constitution. Thank you very much, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org.